It's been awesome. I, I've loved this. And as usual, uh, oh, the mic ain't on? I don't know. I don't, I don't even know where you put it. OK, up here? It's in here. OK, the green light's on. Awesome. Anyway, thank you for letting me know I was talking to the air. Um, this has been tremendous. And I thank God to be a part of it. As usual, Paul Michael Raymond had the best slides. Ron Kranz has the biggest heart. Um, Joel Saint has the best animations in his delivery. And to share the platform with Lieutenant Colonel Cohen and all the other brothers who spoke here, what a great honor. And what a goodness to my heart to be a part of it. We have a couple cards downstairs. One is about how I came to know Christ. I have a website, howjesuschangedmylife.com. I hope you avail yourself to that. And as Paul Michael Raymond mentioned, we have a card to the Leos, law enforcement officers, teaching them the doctrine of lesser magistrate and pointing them to our website. We've done a lot with law enforcement across the country. This drop card is massively important. Understand law enforcement is the muscle of the state. They need to understand they're not mere robots of the state, and they need to understand this doctrine so that they'll do right in the sight of Christ when crunch time hits. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you and praise you for this conference. We ask that you bless what all that was said to the hearts and minds of the people, that they would apply it to their hearts, that they would apply it to their lives, that we would see your republic built in the earth. Lord, we give thanks and praise to you for your goodness to us, that you redeemed us. While we were yet sinners, you loved us. By the power of your Holy Spirit, you regenerated us. And we just ask and pray that we use the days that you've given us for good and to the glory of your name. Build up each home here. May Christ be at the center. May each one have deep love and fealty to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this final topic that I get to speak on is the role of the people in preserving liberty. And this is a massively important topic and one which I am honored to speak on. Last night, I to put forth some thinking about liberty in the lecture regarding how the magistrates preserve liberty in a nation. But when it comes to the role of the people preserving liberty, your role is much bigger than the magistrates. Your role is actually massive for preserving liberty in America. When I first got involved in reading and thinking about all these things that have gone on regarding the founding of our nation and whatnot, I used to think, why would the founders put the onus on the people to preserve liberty? Because when I looked around, it was like pretty much, the people pretty much suck, you know what I mean? Why would they put the onus on them? Why not put the onus on the magistrates? But then after spending several years engaging the magistrates and working with them, I realized they probably put the onus on the people because they probably knew too many magistrates. <laughs> so the onus is on the people. The magistrates suck. When it comes to preserving liberty, I want to look at three areas regarding the role of the people to preserve it. The personal, the home slash community, and the public. So first, the personal. And here's what I have to say. I want to talk about the need for you to refuse to not comply. The strength of the individual to resist and hinder tyranny and preserve liberty is massively huge. Tyranny is built plank by plank. Most people blithely conform to tyranny and tyrants believing that if they accommodate their evil, they can appease their lawlessness. But history has shown us quite the opposite. As people cower and conform, it affords the tyrants the opportunity to continue to build more planks of their tyranny till it becomes impossible or requires bloodshed and force to dislodge it. 
You cannot accommodate and appease a tyrant enough. You must defeat them. The pre-pandemic gave us insight into this matter of how men blithely conform to their own tyrannization and how standing in defiance, one lone person works toward preserving liberty. Your mere refusal to comply with their evil will go a long ways in the days ahead. The tyrants aren't gone. It's an election year. They'll be back. Many people have already returned to their food and drink, their pursuit of wealth and ease, thinking all is good now. They're wrong. This nation is in rebellion to Christ. It's worthy of his just judgment. It will come, and it is a goodness to us when he brings it. Consider the three Hebrew children in the book of Daniel. Only three of thousands of Hebrews that were there Consider those three. We're nearly at that point in our nation, but not quite there. Not as bad as just three. Most today would bow down to whatever the authorities demand or legislator decree. You understand? The mask proved it to us. It was a visible. How is it possible that you're the only person in a store without a mask on? How is it possible? that people would find a thousand justifications to go along with such a massive evil and aid and abet wicked tyrants. If you doubt my assertion that most today would bow down to whatever the authorities demand or legislate, if you doubt that, look at nearly how all wore the mask. And I will tell you this, if you wore that mask, you almost certainly would bow down to that idol the three Hebrew children refused to bow down to as much as you would like to think otherwise. If you wore it and then you repented, that's a different story. But the vast majority of people who complied with that and went along with it, they would have bowed down to that title too. That They would have been not amongst the three. How do I know this? Because just as you were able to make excuses in order to justify putting that dopey totalitarian mask on, you would make excuses in order to justify bowing down to the idol. It's just an idol. God knows I don't view it as an actual God. God knows I am not bowing down to it in my heart, just with my body. And that's what really matters. Excuses to justify conforming. I will wear the mask even though it is part and parcel of a global tyranny rooted in a lie and aids and abets tyrants, I will wear it in order to show love to my fellow Americans. And so I should bow down to the idol. So I show love to my fellow Babylonians. Even though the idol is a lie, it is not really God. I will bow down so I don't offend my fellow Babylonians, so I don't ostracize myself from them and lose the opportunity to speak into their lives, so I don't hurt my witness. I know it's all a lie, like the COVID response is built on a mountain of lies, but I, want to, I don't want to hurt my witness. I really need to go along so I can get along. I have to feed my family. I can spread the lie that the idol is okay to bow down to, just like I spread the lie that COVID response by the government is legitimate by wearing a mask because I'm doing it all in love. Oh, and did I tell you about Romans 13? The three Hebrew children did not bow down. Both what happened to them and the situation we were are Yet Christian churchmen taught Christians how to twist scripture in order to justify their compliance, and in doing so, they spread a lie and aided evil men in their machinations. When the magistrates commit acts of tyranny, if you comply, you are strengthening the evil in the land. Understand that. Understand the power of your refusal to comply. Understand the need for you not to comply so that you do not help strengthen the evil in the land. Remember the guy who stood in front of the tank in Tiananmen Square? I'm telling you what we were up against with the masking and the distancing and the testing and the shock getting. 
It's of equal resistance to that guy standing against the tank by himself. It's the same thing. And it went on for days, months, nearly two years. It's an insane asylum. Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote, quote, you can resolve to live your life with integrity. Let your credo be this. Let the lie come into the world. Let it even triumph, but not through me. Amen. The importance of you to not comply is important to the preservation of liberty. You must stand when you are the only person in the store standing, when your boss is pressuring you all alone in his office, when the company foreman is belittling and demonizing you to your fellow workers, you must stand. Christian people stand because of our love for God, our hatred of evil, and our love for our neighbor. Our theology is what gives us the grit to stand in the teeth of tyranny and evil and preserve liberty. Second, you must stand in your home and in the community to preserve liberty. You must build the kingdom of God in your home. Who cares about everything else? Build it in your home. And you must influence the community in which you reside by speaking and living Christian thought. That preserves liberty in our nation. There is no more important citadel than the home and family government for, for preserving liberty. And understand we have a government that is at war with the family. They are status dogs. They are at war with Christ. And by extension, they are at war with the family because God himself established it and they hate him. It is embedded in his very created order, this matter of family. Civilization grows out of familialism. In other words, family is the foundation of society. Today, in America, marriage and family are at a low ebb. You might have picked up on that, and in deep disarray. All of the studies and statistics point to this fact, and it's attended dire consequences, but you don't even need to read the studies. You can see it with your own eyeballs. And this destruction of the family has been done by design. The laws and policies of American governments, and all the West for that matter, are decidedly against family. A short perusal of divorce laws, the decriminalization of adultery, the legalization are all designed to demean and belittle marriage and family. When one studies the history of these laws, one sees that the people did not clamor for such changes, but rather that they were imposed upon the people by the state, most often through the federal judiciary. Comes to that age-old question. Did the laws change in the nation because of the corrupt morals of the people, or did the government change the laws to corrupt the morals of the people? And it's overwhelmingly when you governments by design make law policy, court opinion, in order to corrupt the morals of the people. Statism is the belief that nothing is beyond the state's reach, that the state is the be all and end all within society, the state is looked to for the cure of every evil and the performance of every task. And every good status knows that in order to strengthen the state, you have to weaken the family. Angelo Cotavia, who went to be with Christ about a year ago, stated in his work, The Character of Nations, which everyone should read, quote, the whole premise of the modern state is sovereignty, namely that nothing is beyond its reach. And that's what they believe. They believe they are God. Family government has been attacked and invaded by civil government. God established the first family, church, civil, and self-government. The first three governments producing within the individual, the fourth, self-government. And in a true federalism, all four great governments matter. In a status hell, civil government invades the others and reigns supreme. We are in a status hell. I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat. Both parties are socialist dogs, period. Atheistic societies tend to make the state God. They also tend to use the rights of the individual 
as a tool to invade every area of people's lives and weaken the other three governments, family, church, and self. We now live in what some sociologists call an atomistic society, A-T-O-M, atomistic society, one in which the individual is held paramount. The desires, ambitions, and happiness of the individual take precedent over one's duty and responsibility to family. Your number one goal, your happiness. The rest of the family be damned. Family is often viewed as an impediment to happiness and fulfillment in this culture. Luxury and ease promotes atomistic thinking. The pursuit of luxury and ease convinces people not to have children. The ill effects of luxury and ease are readily seen in a culture's sexual practices. Luxury and ease has proven historically to be the enemy of man. The enemy of man. Rare is the Christian man who gains wealth and actually uses it towards kingdom building. Rare is that man. Since the French Revolution, governments in the West have shown a propensity to promote and legalize sexual license. Governments have learned that a more sexually licentious people makes for a more easily controlled people politically. A people preoccupied with their next quest to gratify themselves sexually is a people less interested in what their government is doing politically. The people have no interest in freedom or true liberty. In fact, the people actually redefine freedom and liberty in their minds. Americans now think that freedom means you are free to practice whatever sexual perversion you like as long as I'm free to practice any sexual perversion that I like. And there should be no legal consequences for either. The only freedom and liberty they are interested in is that their particular brand of sexual license is legal and not punished by the state. Aldous Huxley, in his insightful work, Brave New World, understood this about governments when he pointed out, quote, as political and economic freedom diminishes, sexual freedom tends to compensatingly increase, end of quote. And so are things here in America. The status have been busy, like little bees, making laws and policies to corrupt the morals of the citizens. We have a government that has been at war with Christ and the family for decades now. This is a decades-long, multi-generational, deep pile of doo-doo. It's like if you ever take a baseball, you know, there's a little rubber ball in the middle, and then there's all these piles of string. We are, we are so far from God's republic being that little rubber ball. In the all this nonsense has to be peeled back. And what peels it back is the truth of God's law and word. That's what peels it back. Sadly, American Christianity has followed this demise. The first Christian body to ever accept birth control in 2,000 years of Christian history just took place less than 100 years ago in 1930. Now all of Christendom accepts the use of birth control, whether in word or practice, and most often in both. American Christianity has also long bought into the lie of feminism and gender egalitarianism and is now busy rewriting 2,000 years of biblical interpretation in order to accommodate itself to homosexual acts. In other words, American Christianity has decided rather than confront the idols and thinking of the world, it will confirm the idols and thinking of the world. And that's what they're busy doing. We live in the midst of a Christianity that is so drunk on the world's wealth and ease that the main function of most churches is to validate Christian suburban lifestyles. American Christians love to listen to religious figures who salve their consciences and help them accommodate to the evil, to the new mores of the culture that they embrace or tolerate in the world. American Christianity helps the state affirm the secularization of America in the minds of Christians. We live in a matriarchal hell, by the way. You want to get a crowd around you, go to the university, stand on a bench and say, do you realize we live in a matriarchal hell? (laughs) Stand on the bench and say, when are you young men going to throw off the matriarchal hell 
The state has put you under. I guarantee you, you'll have 300 people like that. And it is awesome. It is awesome. The matriarchal hell pressures women to leave the home and work and prevents and hinders men from exercising authority over their families and demonstrating biblical love to them. They do not even possess authority over whether their sons and daughters live or die. The vast majority of the present-day Christians are hell-bent to emulate the world and in the end immolate their God-given purpose and created design. They're simply too busy following the world's preaching, pursuing wealth and ease, and having children hinder such goals. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you must behave differently. You must allow God's republic to be built in your home. It has to be in here. You have to be at war with them. The two institutions in this culture that should be strengthening and affirming family, the church and the state, are not doing so. You are on your own. You must hold your family dear. You must protect and cherish your familial relationships. You must sacrifice and demonstrate diligence. You must build your home. We now live in a nation where family has become the counter-revolution. Every one of you who are faithful to Christ are counter-revolutionists now. You are counter-revolutionists just by doing right by your homes. You have the strongest citadel right there to confront their evil and the wrong that they're doing. Your sons and daughters are arrows if you put the time and effort and sacrifice into them. While all of America and the West is committing familial suicide, you must bring them Christian thought and demonstrate Christian living. You must embed it in your homes. You younger men, You must speak with the older men who have built strong homes. Not perfect homes, because there are no perfect homes, but strong homes, and men who have produced faithful sons and daughters. Talk with those men who have a theocentric worldview and who are not weak need to talk about theonomy. Marry, have children, build a home. It is a sacred thing established by God himself. The state is at war with you as a man. I hope you understand that. This whole society and state is at war with you as a man. It's meant to effeminize you, demand you. And so you must wage a war against them by building your home as a citadel of God's republic. You must teach your sons and your daughters manhood and womanhood by example. You must build strong relationships with them, teach them to love to read, to start businesses, to shoot, to engage the culture, let them get the smell of battle in their nostrils. Don't hide them in your hovel. They are arrows in the Lord. Take them out into the marketplace. Let them see you persecuted. Let them see you defend the faith, and they'll do it themselves. One of the worst things about the homeschooling movement is they all wanted to keep their kids sheltered. The dumbest thing. Take them out there. Let them see Christ being delivered to men. Amen? It is massively important. Teach them to speak, to confront evil, topple idols, and engage the magistrates. Homeschool them. There is no more important citadel than the home and family and government for preserving them. Pardon me, for preserving liberty. And you must influence the community in which you reside. You must not just hide out in your home. You must confront the idols, evils, and tyrants of men, manhood, is by taking them out to confront the evils, idols, and tyrants of their day. Pray. Pray. I don't care if you pray publicly or privately, but pray. I've wept for this nation more in the last two and a half years than I did the prior 20 before that. We must cry out to the Lord. Our hearts should be breaking for where this nation is at. As much as I've talked about the righteous judgment of God impending upon this nation, it's heartbreaking to see it unfold. It's like Jeremiah of old, preaching for 50 years, and then when it hit, he wrote Lamentations. He was even stunned by how brutal it is. But it's just. 
preach, and I'm talking about preach publicly. So appreciated Ron's presentation. I can never get away from it. It is so important. I love it. Still go out on the streets to the universities, busy gatherings, young people, they'll keep you going. <laughs> so we have plenty of them around Mercy Seat. Understand after Magdeburg embraced the Reformation in 1524, they were the first city to embrace the Reformation. Luther responded and he said, we took the city without firing a shot, just by being faithful to the word of God. Amen. Speak of the things of God. This is important. Write about the things of God. I know most people think it only Christian piece of literature only has value if there's a sinner's prayer tag to the end. It's not true. Write about everything and anything that's going on in this culture from God's perspective. Keep it short. Give it to people. Often God uses things that they see God has to say about something in his word to begin their journey to Christ. I'm not kidding you, and I've seen this from so many people. The pattern of Christians, churchmen, missionaries before the last 150 years is one that demonstrated that God's law and word was to be applied, not just theory, applied to every area of our life and every area of life. They confronted the idols, evils, and tyrants of the day. These acts of love for Christ and neighbor preserved liberty. Just earlier this week, I was reading once again about William Carey, how he fought for years against the practice in India of burning wives alive. Their husbands died, they got burnt to death too. William Carey didn't say, well, I'm just here to preach the gospel, and uh, so who cares about that over there? No, he saw a great evil and he couldn't be quiet, and he had to speak, and he did. He took flack from Christian people for doing so. Not as much as you'll take today, because they're all sold on their pietistic sloth nonsense. But he still had his detractors back in his day. This, what Kerry did, the missionaries, the churchmen, all did, is the history of Christians, and the history of the churchmen, and the history of the missionaries, and it's all been lost on our generation. We are to denounce evil, confront tyrants, topple idols. And the third thing I want to talk to you about is the role of the people in preserving liberty when it comes to the magistrates. Again, immensely huge. Understand we live in a state as hell, and as such the state believes itself to be God, and they want to rule all. Every area of your life, every area of life, and the process, and in the process create sniveling idiots utterly dependent on the state. Doesn't it break your heart? How is it possible that men who fought in World War II, fought in Korea, fought in Vietnam, dutifully show up at the Piggly Wiggly and put their little mask on to walk in? How is that possible? It's disturbing. They create sniveling idiots utterly dependent on the state both the Democrats and the Republicans do it. They are all socialist dogs. The state demands absolute sovereignty. So what is the role of the people in preserving liberty when it comes to the magistrates? First, understand this and listen to me now. All relationships are contingent upon consent, except those with the state. All relationships in society are contingent upon consent except those with the state. Hence, you must engage the magistrates. You hopefully have realized now you no longer have the convenience of being indifferent towards the unjust and immoral actions of your government. You've realized you must engage. Hopefully you've realized the culture war never ends. That's what so many say, the culture war is over, we lost. The culture war never ends. And if you think it's ended and you've gone home, one day it's gonna walk up your steps knock on your door, and bust into your house. It is never over. Instructing the magistrates in their role, function, duties, and limits is big. Rebuking the magistrates publicly when they do evil is big. Meeting with the magistrates privately to speak with them about civil affairs and to pray with them is big. 
This is the whole history of churchmen and Christians. And yet the current churchmen have pillared a whore of a Christianity, no faithfulness to Christ, no faithfulness to neighbor, abandon the magistrates, sit in their ivory towers, pouring over their latest version of their prophecy charts, consumed with the flight out. If that don't break your heart, what would? It breaks my heart to watch it. Speaking to the magistrates at public hearings, what an opportunity to walk in and give God's perspective to the magistrates and the people who are sitting there, huge, and yet rare is the churchman or Christian who does it. The reformers wrote volumes on the role of the people regarding the magistrates. We must prod them to do right and assure them that we will stand with them if they do do right, with our persons, with our property, with our prayers, both publicly and privately. John Craig wrote a catechism in 1581. He was a Scottish fellow, and his catechism was received by King James VI. Now, when I learned of this, thank you, Rebecca Sheets, John Craig, my grandfather on my mother's side, his last name was Craig, Scottish. He actually came over from Scotland. The Craig motto was, because all Scottish families have one, was live for God and you will live. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Here's what he wrote in his catechism. Quote, we protest and promise with our hearts under the same oath that we shall defend the king's person and authority with our arms, our bodies, and lives in the defense of Christ's gospel, the liberty of our country, the administration of justice, and the punishment of iniquity against all enemies within the realm or without, end of quote. Powerful stuff. They all understood. They had to prod the magistrates and assure them that they stand with them if they do right in the sight of Christ. Prayers for the magistrates should be common amongst us. In Reformation Europe, they were. In early America, they were. The 1658 Savoy Declaration, for example, states, quote, it is the duty of the people to pray for the magistrates, end of quote. The Westminster Confession states, quote, it is the duty of the people to pray for the magistrates to honor their persons, pay tribute or other dues to obey their lawful commands, end of quote. Now understand when you decide to engage the magistrates, understand what you are entering into. G.K. Chesterton wrote this over 100 years ago, and it's still true today. He said, quote, the whole modern world has divided itself into conservatives and progressives. The business of progressives is to go on making mistakes. The business of conservatives is to prevent mistakes from being corrected. Even when the revolutionist might himself repent of his revolution, the traditionalist is already defending it as part of his tradition. Thus, we have two great types. The advanced person who rushes in, rushes us into ruin, and the retrospective person who admires the ruins. That's what you're up against. You'll learn very quickly that both the Democrats and the Republicans have no interest in what God has to say. They have no interest in doing right. They have only interest in aggrandizing their own selves. And they are God-haters, and it's the fault of the pulpits. It is the fault of the pulpits. It's the fault of the pulpits that even the magistrates who claim Christ govern no differently than their secular colleagues. The one test for whether or not you live with political freedom is this, whether the government over you is bound by a law greater than itself. Divine law, God's law, we must bring it to the magistrates. They must understand the importance of plays regarding the duties of their office, its role and its function. The magistrates of our day love power, they love prestige, and they love money. Oh, they love money. They blubber and blather in the mountains of money they possess like Thorin in the mountain of Erebor. I've lived 60 years now, and what I have seen the government do, and from what I have read as to what took place before I was born, is that the government gives credence to the most debased men among us and provide them with the force of law so they are free to imbibe upon their particular form of sexual sin. They use the you and cry of intellectuals within the academic world, debased men, 
who want to use government to justify their sin, and who want to ensure they can abide on their sin without threat of civil consequence, without the threat of sanctions. When governments make law, policy, or court opinion to upend the morals of individuals with the design to weaken family government, they always give license to the most debased men among us to accomplish it. It's like a devolving thing from generation to generation. It becomes normalized within one generation and is accepted as unquestioning by the, pre, by the subsequent generation. These lawless men in government over the last 100 years have been busy constructing, as David Lowenthal says, he's got an awesome book you should read, entitled No Liberty for License. Lowenthal calls it the freedom to destroy freedom. <laughs> That's what our government's been busy doing for well over 100 years now. They attacked the coverture laws way back in the 1850s. This has long been headed in the wrong direction. And the truth is, often the most debased men are at the power levers of government itself. You may have picked up on that. Take Justice William O. Douglas, who wrote his concurring opinion to the court's decision in the Fannie Hill case. By the way, you should read Clark's dissenting opinion on the Fannie Hill case. Justice Douglas was married four times. He was divorced three times because he was committing adultery every time. After his second divorce at age 64, he married a 23-year-old woman. Then he committed adultery on her and at age 64. And of course, in 1973, he also voted in favor of Roe v. Wade so the preborn could be butchered. He was a rat of a man. As with most all men, his personal life influenced his public life. You don't separate the two. In closing, let me say, America has lost her way. Her laws, policies, and court opinions spit in the face of Christ and impugn God's law and word. So while Americans are sold license disguised as liberty and think they are free, they are slaves to sin and makes them more easily slaves to the state. Culture is religion externalized, and atheistic cultures most always turn into status cultures because religion is inescapable. So atheists turn to the state. They make the state God. Atheistic cultures end up as status totalitarian hells or hedonistic sewers, or both. America is both. But Christian men and Christianity produce something far different. We as Christian men understand and cherish liberty more than all other men. And why is that? It's because liberty is rooted in our religion, unlike the religion of the atheist. Our desire to not be subjugated by men, not be subjugated by the state, is rooted in our theology. In fact, it is rooted in the most prized aspect of our Christian faith, namely the finished work of Christ at Calvary. He has ransomed us. Others shall not own us. No man, no state. We are his. We are free men. And this is why the statists hate Christ and hate Christianity. I'm talking about real, true Christianity, because a true Christianity cannot be subjugated by the state. We are not to be subjugated by the state. Listen to the command of Scripture in 1 Corinthians 7.23. Quote, you were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. End of quote. Why are we not to become the slaves of men? Because we've been ransomed by Christ. He owns us. He bought us. As I said, liberty is rooted in our religion. We have been ransomed by Christ. We are not. People, we cannot be subjugated by the state. Our love and loyalty and fealty is to another Christ. And this is what brings us into conflict with the state. When it makes law contrary to his law and word, when it assumes power beyond its limits, we refuse to obey. We refuse to be subjugated. And this is a great goodness to society at large. As much as they hate Christ and Christians and Christianity, they have no idea how much they've benefited from those who walk faithful to him, who are willing to take upon themselves the suffering and persecutions of the state only because of their love for Christ and neighbor.
In ancient Rome, conquered soldiers stripped of their uniforms were actually forced to pass under an ox, an ox yoke as a sign of submission to the Roman victors. But a truly Christian people will not do that. They will stay true to their Lord. They will not be owned or controlled by the state. They will not be owned or controlled by rich men who want to buy them. You know the Gadsden flag? Little snake, do not tread on me. The earliest reference to that statement, do not tread on me, that I've been able to find, and you can tell me later if you found something earlier, I'm all for it, is from a Lutheran reformer named Johannes Brenz in 1535. He was denouncing Emperor Charles V, and he said this, quote, you may strangle our people and burn our books, but the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is pure and clear among us, cries out in defiance of all human power, do not tread on me, end of quote. Christianity produces liberty in individuals. It produces liberty within nations. This is big. A truly Christian people will stay true to their Lord. They will not be owned or controlled by the state. This is why in the year 1773, the men of Marlborough, Massachusetts, set forth a declaration in defiance of British tyranny, which said in part, death is more eligible than slavery. A freeborn people are not required by the religion of Jesus Christ to submit to tyranny. What is tyranny? When the magistrates govern contrary to the law and word of God. That's what tyranny is. Death is more eligible than slavery. A freeborn people are not required by the religion of Jesus Christ to submit to tyranny, but may make use of such power as God has given them to recover and support their laws and their liberties. End of quote. These men were wholly unlike the men of America in our day that control all aspects of their lives, the status dogs that have invaded church government, family government. But be imbued with hope. The best thing we have going for us in America is tyrants themselves. God unleashing mercy to us. It is a goodness to us. And it's a needed mercy. It's a needed goodness. Understand we have the whole created order of God and its consequences, special judgments of God with us. <laughs> and it's only going to increase as the rebellion increases. And what does that do? The consequences of the rebellion? Regarding the created order, it gives men ears to hear. We saw a little picture of it. Two years ago, a year ago, when all the crazy stuff was going on, but you have to admit, very little repentance. Much more has much more judgment, and the consequences of rebellion against have to come our way. A lot of people think that God brings his judgment, everything's annihilated, and then we rebuild, right? It's not true. God's rebuilding during his judgment. God's rebuilding during his judgment. He's taking down the institutional power bases while at the same time raising up. We are in epoch-changing times. This dopey form, weak need form of Christianity that makes you sick. I told my April, you know what state tyrants going home at this time? What stinks about it is all the little dopey pietists have finally put their head boop, back up out of their little groundhog hall. Uh, and once again, we have to put up with their dope and sayings and their weak need form of Christianity. Wasn't it nice that they were gone for two years? It was so good. He's busy while judging that form of Christianity, which is incapable of reforming itself, so he must judge it. He's at the same time building a tougher, more biblical form of Christianity in the land. And you can see this in many areas, the area of medicine, too. All these alternative organizations starting up regarding health and medicine. Well, 
He's taking down the medical industry, judging it into the ground. I'll end here tonight with what I ended with yesterday. As the suffocating blanket of tyranny settles in on us, let us remember the stages that our evangelical leaders have brought us through. Number one, there any need to fight. Secondly, they told us, well, there may come a time when it is necessary to fight. Then they told us, number three, well, it's too early to fight. And then number four, now they're telling us it's too late to fight. And now we live in a post-Christian era. But our duty remains the same. Our duty remains the same. We must bring the law and word of God to the people and the civil authorities and instruct them regarding their role, functions, duties, and limits. May Christ be praised. God bless you and thank you for letting me be here.